Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Starting Small. Today, I'm joined by Quade Walker of Bezel. Quade, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, so I'd like to start out with your upbringing. Um, where did you grow up, and what would you say your childhood was like? Yeah, I grew up in L.A. Um, my childhood was was awesome. It was a lot of sports. I was very into like sports and, and things like that. Spent a lot of time at the beach, kind of in LA, grew up surfing a lot and, and spent a lot of time there. And then I had kind of very much like a creative side. So I did a lot of like art as a kid, was really into design and, and things like that. And that ultimately kind of pushed me, I think, into kind of what I what I wanted to do professionally and, and kind of what I ended up going to college for and, and things like that. So um, yeah. that was kind of the, the genesis for all of that. For sure. I'm, I'm curious, like as a kid growing up, what were some of your aspirations or what did you enjoy doing like sports or lemonade stands where did you have an entrepreneurial spirit? What, what was that like? Yeah, I think I kind of always had an interest in making stuff. Like I think design for me became kind of the catalyst to, to creating stuff in a way like I, I was always in the kind of like my dad's workshop. My dad was very handy growing up. Like he he built kind of the first house that we had and spent a lot of time like, you know, making stuff in front of me. And so I just, I grew up with a passion for that generally, but it wasn't super tactile. Like I didn't, I wasn't like a particularly good builder physically and things like that. So um, I got really into technology as soon as that kind of became available to me. So like when the iPhone came out and things like that, I just like nerded out a ton in the intersection of design and technology and it finally became mm. this really interesting opportunity where I felt like I could like make things in a very physical way and, and kind of create stuff and, and release them in the world and I got really sucked into like apps and the construct of building that um, mm. but yeah that was kind of like later in in high school and kind of early college for the majority of like my childhood it was obsession I played soccer growing up very competitively so it was a lot of sports and a lot of travel for that. And so I think like when I was a kid, I, I always had ambitions of like being entrepreneurial, but you know, half of my childhood was very baked and I just wanted to play sports and I wanted to surf and I wanted to be my friends and, and kind of do that. For sure. So it was really, I got an awesome opportunity my senior year summer in high school where a family friend of mine had mentioned that they had worked with, uh, you know, a designer and the designer was super successful and had like kind of led design Nokia. His name was Frank Nuovo. Um, mm. He had some connection to him. And so I emailed him probably every week for almost a year, just trying to get his attention. And cause I was just a kid in high school. And like, I think it, I was not going to provide a lot of value for his, his design in his design studio. So finally, yeah he uh, gave me kind of the initial meeting and I just begged him to have access to like an internship or something. I didn't want to get paid. I just wanted to like spend time and, and learn via osmosis. And so yeah. that was my first kind of entryway into becoming a designer. And, and when I say a designer, I didn't even know, I ended up being like a product designer, but at the time I just like had this esoteric understanding of wanting to make stuff creatively. So they were industrial yeah. designers, they were doing digital design, and I got a great feel of everything and kind of fell into the the role that I ended up having later in my career at Google and then ultimately which drove me to, to Bezel. Wow, very cool. So this role that you kind of just cold outreached on, was this all prior to uh, your college education? Did you continue that going into school? Or what did that look like? Yeah, so it was really interesting. Um, I knew when I wanted to go to school, I wanted to study kind of the overlap of business and design. And I didn't have a really good reason for that. I think like there's probably this, this like internal interest in like building a business around it. Like I, maybe it was to make my parents happy. Like there was some, there was some aspect that made me want to like talk through the monetary side of it and the financial side of it and like being able to build something with it. So I knew that business needed to be involved with it. But I also wanted to go to art school. Um, mm. I didn't know what that meant. I knew that I wanted to do graphic design or like some portion of design. And then yeah. I got kind of wiped into this like product design world with the internship before college. I spent 
a bunch of time figuring out like what schools made the most sense. I ended up landing on, on Washington University in St. Louis because they had a really amazing business program in, in kind of the Olin School of Business. And they had a really strong art program in, in San Fox. So it allowed me to do a dual degree there. So mm. uh, got laser focused on too many things at once. I would say I took way too many credits. I played soccer there for my first year. And just threw myself in kind of this left brain, right brain pursuit where half my time Mm. was kind of early stage, basic business courses. And the other side, like I was in studios, you know, doing the introductory art courses. So design one and figure drawing and things like that. So it gave me a really cool overlap of a a lot of really different people. Um, So that's kind of how I continued into college. And while I was there, I just got so lucky to have worked with the agency that I worked for the summer before. So they kept me on mm-hmm. as kind of like a consultant at, at afar. And and so I, yeah. before working remotely was cool or, or like a thing, they allowed me to kind of do projects while I was in college and still keep in touch with them. I took mm-hmm. on clients through them and, and we did a lot of awesome work and it just kept my passion, you know, really fueled for the prospect of designing digital products. Yeah, um, for sure. And so it was just super fun. And then from there, I ended up dropping out of college as a sophomore because mm. they ended up giving me like more of a full-time role there. And so I got to work with really, with our client at the time was Samsung. We were working on a really cool mm. project. I was really excited about it. And I wanted to work and kind of start building my own startups. So I left school as a sophomore didn't really have a plan, just kind of took these jobs, started working on it, figured out how to become a designer and and work my way through that. Um, And then ultimately ended up finishing school at USC because I just missed the prospect. A lot of parents sat me down and said, like, you're going to, you're going to be bummed if you don't have this college experience, you're going to, you're going to look back on it and and miss the social aspect and the friendships you would build. So I finished at USC, got very lucky to get an internship at Google on the music team Mm -hmm. as a designer, ended up getting a converting offer and then kind of spent my career at Google that ultimately led me to leaving and starting this business. Love it. What was that gap like when from the dropout period and then going back to USC and finishing the degree? What was that period? How long did you then work at that company before going back? It was like almost a year uh, from me doing the work to me deciding I want to go back to college. Yeah. Um, I remember it felt like I was doing something wrong. Like I, I found like a, like a hack in the system, right? Like I think growing up as, as kids, you're, you're taught that, that like college, and I think, it, I think it's a little bit different now, but like college is the linear path forward and you have to matriculate through it. And that is like the only option you have. Um, yeah. and so it, like I moved back home and all my friends were in college and all of a sudden I was back in the city I wanted to be in, but it felt like I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing. Mm. Um, and I was working a ton and all my colleagues were super inspired, but inspiring, but they're, they're older. And so I, it felt like I was like a, I don't know, you know, 35 year old kind of caught in like an 18, 19 year old body for a little while. And that felt <laughs> odd. Um, yeah. It's really cool for a few months. And then you're like, where are my friends? Like I'm missing out. I'm getting Snapchats of everyone doing fun things. You have serious <laughs> FOMO. And I was just such a nerd and and very laser focused on wanting to make stuff that I was super fueled. Like the prospect of getting flown out to a different city by a company to do consult, like that was the staying in a hotel and having a business Mm. pay for it was just like the coolest thing. Oh, I get Um, it for sure. So I was lost in that. And then I don't know, about a year into it, I was like, okay, I got to go back to school and have some fun and make some friends and, you know, be normal kids for a little while. (laughs) So. Before we get into Bezel, I, I definitely want to cover some of your journey within Google. We have a lot of tech founders and tech enthusiasts who listen. What what did that onboarding process look like? So you joined as an intern and then eventually mm-hmm. full time. What does that onboarding kind of process look like at a company like Google? Yeah, it was it was an awesome experience. I mean, it's the coolest place to intern. I'm very biased, but it, I think they they nailed that experience. Learned a ton. Um, and just you feel so supported the whole way. And I remember leaving the internship, which is like a job. I remember leaving the job, yeah. not knowing if I was coming back, but being so sad to be leaving because mm. it just felt, I don't know, like it has this, especially at that stage in your life, it has this feeling of being on like a college campus, but 
everyone's incredibly intelligent. Like I've never been around so many like concentrated, very smart individuals. I just felt like I learned so much and it just pushed you to grow in a way that didn't feel scary. It felt very supported and controlled and thoughtful. So yeah, uh, that was awesome. The converting process, you have to do a bunch of different interviews. Like it's not just, I don't know if it's, it's been, you know, two and a half years since I've been in, you know, I've been interviewing folks at Google for, for roles, but uh, yep. you had to go through converting interviews and like, it wasn't like just knock out the internship out of the park and then you get a job. It was very <laughs> procedural and there's a lot of checks and balances associated with that. So I left mm -hmm. after the summer, not knowing if I would come back, but I did all my conversion stuff. And then I found out in the fall of my senior year that I had gotten a converting offer and called my mom mm -hmm. and it was, you know, it was a very emotional, great moment, which is great. Um, yeah. and then because I did an extra, like I took a year off, I had an extra semester. So I really had a year and a half of the Google offer being accepted. So that was an amazing mm -hmm. experience to just, like I worked on different startups and I got to just explore stuff and, and just really just take as much advantage of just trying to learn and, and build my own like personal skill set as much as possible. Um, For sure. start, started at Google in December of 2016, I think math. Mm -hmm. Um, and spent, you know, up until working at Bezel there the entire time, never worked anywhere else. I had a really amazing manager at Google that just unlocked my career for me there. I sat down with her on the first week and I said, Hey, Addy, like, I want to move fast. I want, I want to be, I want to be, I want to feel overwhelmed. Like I want you to, I want you to like give me stuff. I want to work. I want to prove myself. Like I, I want to matriculate through this process as quickly as possible. And I think a lot yeah. of managers would have said, whoa, like, I don't know if you can handle that, like settle down. I think her response was amazing in the sense that it was like, okay, great. Like let's, here's mm -hmm. what you have to do if that's the path that you want to be on. So she's yeah. just made it happen for me. I, I just worked super, super hard went kind of through the system very quickly and ended up putting myself in a position where I, I had a, a really amazing opportunity where a lot of folks within Google were thinking about starting kind of a new project. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of them are working on it kind of on the side. And the bet was uh, like you had products like Amazon Fire TV and you had Apple TV and like Google didn't really have a, a TV narrative in the sense that it was like aggregation and, and doing cool stuff. So um, yep. got really lucky that that happened to like spin up. I was already working in the entertainment kind of movie side of the equation at Google. So I mm. kind of joined that little skunk works team of a few select individuals on the side was working as a side project. We ended Very up, cool. or they ended up raising money internally. And then that became like my full-time job. And, you know, now it's hundreds of people work on it. And it was a really awesome kind of zero to one. I had always mm. thought I would go to Google work there for a year or two, get that on my resume and get that credibility associated with like working on big projects. And then I would go start yeah. something, but I kind of got to feel like I, I was on a, you know, the ground floor of a startup within Google. And that just kept me there for, you know, five or so years. Um, for sure. But yeah, it was an amazing experience. And I, I recognized how lucky I was to not just be able to work at, you know, such a big corporate environment that was, that was amazing and stable, but also have that kind of zero to one startup experience within there. I know that's, you know, super rare, but it was amazing. Oh, totally. Totally. I, I would love to hear, like, if there's one project of your time there that you're most proud of, if you can reflect on that, that maybe influenced Bezel as it is today. Yeah. I mean, it would certainly be this Google TV project just because yeah. it started as an idea on a whiteboard that we were all working on. Um, I was kind of the first IC designer that was cranking on it. There was a like more senior designer that was managing me at the time on on the project, but um, so obviously a lot of that was due to his guidance and allowing me to kind of jump on the project and, and empower me to do so. But, uh, I got to basically design an entire operating system for a television from the ground up. I mm. got to just like solve problems and there was real budget behind it. And I was managing a team of consultants and it was just a very crazy thing because yeah. I was probably 22 at the time. Um, yeah. so it was a really big project for someone that was quite young. Um, and I just yeah. got really lucky that they like, they were willing to, to gamble on me. It's probably a combination of both like me asking for it and then, you know, reluctantly trusting me or also just like a lack of resources because I got lucky that it was a small project that became quite large. So, um, but yeah, it was amazing from like, I don't know if this project's going to exist ever to a oh, holy shit. It actually is going to exist to, it's actually going to 
get the name Google TV, like it's branded as like owned by Google to, you know, it's yeah. live in hundreds of millions of households, right? So I think that's the coolest thing. Like even today, the reason I, I left because I was obsessed with watches through that process. Like my first bonus went to buying a watch and I saw an opportunity to build something mm. better than was out there and, and that oriented itself towards kind of a first time watch buyer like myself, which it sounds like we'll go into in a bit. But yeah. I think it was also like, I'm a big fan of thinking about careers as kind of a narrative. And the reason I left Google when I left is like, it felt like the coolest thing I have ever done ever was launch that project. Yep. And I had an opportunity to just keep working with it and like make it incrementally better. But I don't think any of those moments would have like out shown the fact that I la that we launched it. Like that was the big kind of emphatic stamp on the narrative that is my life and so yeah. i knew that i kind of wanted to do something else and at that time i had just got obsessed with watches i was the weirdo that had a second monitor on my desk to like analyze the watch market i my first bonus ever at google went towards buying a watch and i think wow. my expectation in buying a watch was you know, these are really expensive things uh, I was used to collecting sneakers and like, you know, streetwear on, on other kind of verticalized marketplaces like a StockX or a GOAT. My expectation yeah. was if I'm going to spend $20,000 on the internet, it's probably going to be pretty good. Like it's going to have like a really high quality, technologically forward, modern feeling product. In reality, yeah. I was so nervous and I didn't, it felt like there was a lot of barrier of entry. And it was this kind of insider's club and I was an outsider and I didn't know who to ask and I didn't know who to trust. And a lot of like people in my network that I that I had had spoken to about it had had gotten fakes from different services, and it was sounding very mm. scary. And so, um, yeah. it was a laborious process. And our bet was, can we build a product that optimizes for authenticating all these watches and does so in a way that builds trust with the end customer? And that kind of was the genesis of, of Bezel and ultimately why we left. Mm. So, at what point did you feel like, or what was your comfort level like with that departure of? A kind of a safe, comfortable job in corporate world at Google and then leaving officially in 2021. What made that kind of, what made you feel comfortable with the full departure um, with Bezel then financially? How did that kind of play out? Yeah, it's a great question. I think like it took a year of yeah. this should exist in this world and it doesn't, but I should like, am I the one that's going to do it? Like why, like why am I qualified to do it? should I risk this? I guess there's just a lot of like imposter sure. syndrome esque feelings associated with like starting a business is a non-trivial thing. It's a, you know, a 10 year commitment for the rest of your, like your, that's what you're focusing on. You need yep. to grind it out. And I wish like, to be honest, people told me that like since running the business, people didn't tell me that nearly, nearly enough. Like my, the biggest thing I tell founders that I talk to now is, is like really be obsessed with the problem that you're solving because it's hard. Mm. And it's not quick. And you read about the stories of founders that start businesses, they raise their first round, they sell it within a year and a half, two years, and they move on to do something else. And like, that's just like not the norm. Like the, the norm of these founders that grind these things out for a decade and they get their IPO or they get their moment or they get their kind of exit at that point. But so yep. it took me a long time to, it was less about the financial side. It was more about like, am I, can I pull this off in a way that, that I feel like we are, we being me and my co-founders, I'm lucky to have two amazing co-founders. Um, mm -hmm. We are uniquely qualified to do this. And I feel like we can win here in the sense that I could go out and I can raise money and I can confidently say to our investors, like we will go get, we'll return your, like we're going to build what we say we are. Right. So it took a while yeah. of just noodling on it to figure that out. Really, really lucky to have, while I was at Google, you know, I met a lot of really amazing people in the startup ecosystem and got a lot of great people as like a support kind of mentor network very yep. early in the thought process of Bezel. And so a lot of those, their previous operators, you know, investors, things like that, they came on as kind of like early stage angels, which gave me a lot of conviction to do it because obviously like they were much smarter than I was. Um, yep. And then the market just felt right. The the timeline of where I was in my career, where I was kind of ready to take my next, next, my next move. And obviously like I had focused heavily that year on just like downside risk of making sure that I had saved the money I needed to save for my life. Personally, the venture environment was a particular interesting. So we, 
I left my job in August of 2021 to start Bezel. Um, mm -hmm. It was a particularly frothy venture market. So we were able to, like with just a pitch deck, go out and raise kind of our earliest round at pretty favorable terms. And so yep. the transition of leaving my job to having capital in the bank and, and running was a, was a very swift one. Like it was, I, we only kind of went maybe two weeks of a world where it was a little bit uncertain. And so uh, we've just not looked back since. So it's been, I'm very happy I made the decision. We've learned, I learned so much and the business is luckily in a really awesome place now, but it's been such an amazing growth opportunity and I, I don't regret a, a moment of it. For sure. So that like seed round, once you left, did you have an interface built or so you had the pitch deck? Was it any, yeah. I mean, the proof of concept, but nothing to show. What, what did that look like when pitching investors? Yeah, we didn't have a proof of concept. We didn't, we had nothing, right? We had just the pitch deck. Yeah. Um, and I think we're lucky and we were able to pull that off because like we weren't doing something that was like particularly complex. Like we our whole bet and the pitch to investors was we're going to build out a better product from the buyer side, like a better interface, a better experience, more technology. We're going to make sure that everything that is sold ships to us first. So it's authenticated in-house by a team of experts. And we do everything mm -hmm. from, you know, making sure it's real and authentic factory parts. We run everything against like a diagnostic check. So it's running the way it should. We run everything against like a lost registry to make sure it's never reported stolen. So wasn't complicated from like a investor's perspective. Like it's a managed marketplace, right? Like they've seen that model play out in, in StockX and go to another verticalized spaces. And yep. so it really came down to like, can this team execute on it? And so I'm really lucky that that I was raising this capital not by myself. My background is very much deeply in the in the product side of the equation. So I had a lot of product chops at the time because I had just come off of the Google TV launch and I like could could talk the talk from like a product execution perspective. And then yep. my second co-founder, his name is Chase Pion. He comes from kind of the finance world, um, mm. worked in, you know, JP Morgan, number of hedge funds, smartest person I've ever met, like very, very strong in the kind of financial side of the world. So he was able to kind of build up the model and like we were able to just talk through like the expectations and establish like credibility there. And then my third mm -hmm. co-founder, his name is Daryl Johnson. He's our CTO. Him and I had started a, a business in the past together. And then he was at Google as well for you know five or so years. So we kind of had the, the three equation there that like could build a, a thoughtful product. And then our, our first hire was um, used to be a director of private sales at Sotheby's. His name is Ryan Chong. And he handles kind of our, our watch department and, and kind of built everything mm -hmm. underneath him from an authenticity perspective. So we just yep. had the right people around the table we had the right angels early, the right angels then set us up to have the conversations with the right kind of more institutional investors. And then mm -hmm. we kind of went from there. So it, okay. it, when you look back on it, you think it's smooth and it, and it was, but at the same time, like there was a lot of, we probably talked, we, had, we ran a tight process. We talked to probably a hundred funds, you know, and a handful yeah. said yes. Right. And, and so For sure. um, that was kind of the way it was the first time ever doing that. So it was a lot of learning process and emotional roller coaster. Everyone that was close to me in my life was just kind of there picking me up. But um, we ended up getting it done and we had an amazing kind of set of partners on the investment side. So we're super, super lucky to have them. Love it. I mean, it sounds like a, a lean, but a very powerful founding team you guys had at launch. So that's super exciting. What did um, that launch officially look like? Did How did you guys, I mean, your first hire, did, did he go out and outside sales? What did that look like to bring on watches? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, it's like starting, I mean, starting a marketplace is challenging in the sense that like, it's a, what side do you focus on first? Like, do you go out yeah. and do we go acquire a bunch of demand on the buy side or do we go out and we acquire supply? Our bet in the beginning was, I think we'll have an easier chance getting the watches than we will be getting the buyers. The buyers are going to come through the watches, right? Like they're going to search on yeah. Google some specific reference for a watch. We're going to show up. And then they're going to, you know, find us that way. We went out and we went to a lot, like a lot of the largest dealers in the U S and these are dealers that list on our competitors and things like that. And we just through Ryan, our, our head of watch ops connections, built relationships with them. We sat in front of them. We showed them prototypes. We got them involved in the process. Like we just got them very excited and, and we just obsessed over giving them an amazing experience and making it so easy. And I remember in the early days, like, 
we were uploading their inventory and we were making it nice and we were flying someone out to take the photos and like we were doing all the things that made them just mm. very hard for them to say no. And yeah. to be honest, like, I don't know if that's ever going to change. Like we're doing, you know, meaningful sales now. And you could argue that once we have more leverage, then we can do more interesting things and like we can relax a little bit. But to be honest, like we're just, all we're doing now is instead of flying someone out there to take photos, like we're building straight up tools for sellers to better manage their business and things like that. So it's, it's yep. kind of been an obsession of giving the easiest place to sell your watch. And then our promise to the buyers once we had the inventory was like trust, trust, built a brand that felt newer and fresher. We were very lucky and, and strategic in the fundraising round to get a lot of big names that are massive collectors around the cap table. So, you know, folks like Kevin Hart and John Legend and and Steve Aoki and Michael Rubin were like all in the the initial round. And yeah. I think that was just an exercise in telling the story to them as collectors because they love watches and sure. they've all felt the feeling of not knowing if they're getting something legitimate, even though they're so incredibly famous and have access to so many awesome things. Like I think you still can't find watches sometimes and you're still nervous and you feel like you don't know who to trust. It resonated yeah. with them and it allowed us to leverage kind of their brand in the early days when we were mm -hmm. trying to acquire customers and get press because our average order value is $12,000, right? Like it's, wow. it's not a small purchase. So the <laughs> question is how do you convince a consumer that, that you, you can be trusted with their money and yeah. it's a massive responsibility. So a lot of, a lot of what we built was like taking the first year really to make sure the product is perfect, to build the brand, to make sure everything was in the right place where we would not make mistakes. Obviously yeah. having a plan if mistakes would happen. So we, we ran a, a closed beta of the product for the first year or so, and then uh, really launched officially in June of 22 was when we pulled the waitlist off. And then we really yeah. announced ourselves like in the press and announced the round and everything in January of 23. So it was a lot of heads down work before we even really existed as a business. Yeah. I mean, having notable investors like that from the start is definitely a big momentum push, um, credibility factor, as you mentioned. Uh, but for the listeners out there, what does the authentication process look like from Bezel's point of view? So you do develop that trust. What does that look like overall? Yeah. And I think like what we realized in the early days was authentic authentication. Like that word is, is so overused that yeah. like we meant it seriously, but it was kind of like, people would glaze their eyes over because a lot of folks that didn't mean it seriously would say it, or like it just didn't resonate the way that we wanted it to, to customers. So we realized very early that it was less about talking the talk and more about walking the walk. So mm. like, how do we obsess over having the most kind of stringent high touch authentication process in the industry? And then how do we showcase that? How do we walk folks through that? How do we be very, very transparent about that, create content around that? So high level, the way that we think about authentication is like a top of funnel and a bottom of funnel solution. The top of funnel mm -hmm. is when someone lists a watch on our platform, we don't want to just like let them do that, right? Like we want to make sure that someone on our team is reviewing that listing before it goes live to make sure there's nothing like glaringly wrong with that. So like, it's hard to say that we're authentic if yeah. you then would browse our marketplace and you could find a couple, you know, things that would not de be deemed as like, you know, factory or things like that. Right. So that's where the authentication starts. And then once a watch is sold, the seller overnights the watch to us. We own that process. Like we send them the label, they send it to us. And then we spend a day or two with every watch in the actual Bezel HQ. Uh, we have a number mm -hmm. of kind of like watchmakers and authenticators in the office. As I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, it goes through multiple folks' hands on the authenticity side. So they're looking at it under like deep magnification. They're looking at all aspects of the watch. They're examining the kind of accessories, the paperwork, things like that. Once it passes yeah. that, it gets handed off to like one of our, max, our, our watchmakers. Uh, then we're diagnostic checking. So we're going through a time loss test, a pressure test. Uh, and then ultimately kind of when it passes kind of a performance check, because the goal there is if it's authentic, but you're buying a dive watch and you can't actually take it in the water because it doesn't pass pressure, that sucks. Like that's that's not the buyer experience that we want. So we want to make yep. sure it's performing the way that it should. 
and then we run everything against a loss registry, it's it's crazy. So a lot of the watches that that we had come through like have actually been reported stolen in wow. you know some we we had a watch that was a seventy or so thousand dollar watch that was reported stolen in like a high profile samurai sword heist in London. And wow. if you're the buyer and you didn't have that check done, you would have no recourse if an insurance company or the authorities at some point mm. realize you had the watch because it's technically not, even though you paid for it, it's not yeah. actually your watch. So um, our goal was to just protect buyers and make sure that they were getting what they expected. And the staggering number is we released this in Q3 of last year, but 23% of the watches that are attempted to be sold are blocked at some way through that process. So mm. almost a quarter of the watches and our sellers represent the best sellers in the U S today have yep. some issue that we feel like is not good enough to pass on to our buyers. And mm. that's kind of why, you know, we do this. It's like, it's a massive problem. And these are really celebratory, super expensive luxury items. And we don't want our buyers to spend a second worrying if they made the right choice or not. For sure. What, what do you do if like a ma major issue pops up or reported stolen, as you mentioned, what does that look like? Do you guys send it back? Does it cause a lot of conflict? Like, how does that play out? It's a great question. So the cool thing is, is the way the process works is when a buyer checks out on the watch, like we hold the funds in escrow and then the mm -hmm. seller ships us to the watch. So like no payment has changed hands until it's deemed authentic. So if it's deemed yep. authentic, the funds are passed off to the seller. And the cool thing is because we're, we're the ones that are deeming it authentic. We're able to pay sellers much faster than any of kind of our competitors are able to. Like they get paid typically within like two to three days of the sale, uh, which mm -hmm. is crazy fast for the industry. Yep. Um, if it's deemed inauthentic, it's typically a process of talking with the buyer, explaining transparently the situation that happened and what's going on. And the sale is, is reversed back to the seller. We have a kind of payment system. So if sellers are sending us things that are not authentic, they're like, fee structure goes up until the point that they're like no longer allowed to be a seller. It depends how egregious, obviously the offense is. And then with the buyer, mm -hmm. the cool process is we're able to kind of protect them in that case. And then our concierge team is so quick that we, you know, you know, are more cases than not are able to source the same watch for them at the same price at the same quality very, very quickly. So typically like, you know, within a day or two, we've replaced your watch with something else. Mm. Obviously, it's entirely up to the buyer if that's something they'd like to do, but majority of yep. the cases ended up doing that. So that was our biggest fear, though, when starting this business, when we just had the pitch deck, it was, okay, so we're going to protect buyers, right? But that's still a bad experience. If you wanted to buy this thing, you're really excited, you're like, wait, you press purchase, and you're like, you can't wait till it gets delivered. If, if anyone's like me, like, yeah. when I buy something new, I can't wait to wear it. I'm going to wear it that night. Like I'm obsessed with getting something if I bought it. For and sure. I might, we may be protecting you, but you're ultimately not getting your thing or you're getting it at some degree of a delay. Like that sucks. And so mm. that was a big concern. But in reality, what we found is it's just such a visceral example of why we need to exist for the buyer that uh, most of the buyers like get a real walk, like kind of walk the walk type of an example of, of why this exists mm -hmm. and, and why we take so much care here that they end up kind of becoming some of our more loyal repeat purchasers because they got to experience the actual check. So for sure. Great. So, I mean, you, have, you mentioned the average order value um, kind of initially, but if you can, can you depict maybe what that largest transaction might've been uh, in Bessel history so far? Yeah. Curious. So we had our, we had our first seven figure, transaction in wow. uh in uh q4 of last year so uh last year was like a real like our first year of operating so it's awesome to have hit that kind of within our, wow. our, our first year so um Amazing. cheap cheapest watch we sold last year i believe was was just north of a thousand dollars and most expensive was in the seven figures it was a you know a tiffany nautilus the um mm. special edition that had existed in 170 pieces um wow. and we kind of do everything in between so you know, a lot of high end six figure pieces all the way down to, you know, a lot of starter watches that are, you know, a thousand dollars or more. Yep. I mean, looking at bezel and the growth into the future, I mean, what kind of um, integrations do you see possibly playing out? I know you guys just launched the auctions here this year. If you can dive into that as well, what was, what was kind of the reason of launching auctions and how do you see that playing out for the future? Yeah. So we started as kind of like a true marketplace. Obviously, you're you're listing fixed price items 
and mm -hmm. we're doing our best to find a buyer for them. We found a lot of success in an offer product. So a lot of our sales catalyze through offers. I'll list a watch for $10,000. You'll lob me a $7,000 offer and we'll go back and forth and both walk away feeling like winners, right? So um, that gave a lot of success. What we realized is that there's two really interesting things that auctions does. One is it offers this really sticky, high retention, fun, kind of gamified feel to the product. We're dropping currently 21 watches a week. They're all seven day auctions and they all start at $500. So if you think about that, it's this really fun example where, you know, the most expensive watch we sold at auction so far, I believe was just under $120,000 and we'll sell wow. watches all the way down to a thousand dollars, but they all start at $500 and they drop multiple times throughout the week. So it's a fun wow. reason to come back to bezel. It's a really awesome opportunity. If you've been eyeing a watch, that you want to like maybe go get a great deal on it and, and, and kind of snag that. So it just brought some excitement into the product that we felt like we're really excited. I, I think about the last year for us is like foundation building. It was, let's go out, let's make sure we're obsessing over quality of customer experience and product and building out like a very trusted experience. I yeah. think about this year is now that we have that foundation, how can we just really flex the fact that you know, we're a technology business and we can do a lot of really fun kind of first time things happening in the watch world. So auctions was our take on, obviously auctions are very big in watches, but merging the marketplace and auctions and putting it all into kind of a fun product. The second yep. thing is from a sell side, it now unlocks kind of seven day liquidity. So typically if I'm listing on the bezel marketplace, I'm listing it at full price and I'm just hoping a buyer comes around. And that happens oftentimes that like someone will list something and it'll immediately sell, but you know, it's not a guarantee. And sometimes depending on the demand for that watch, depending on the pricing, it might take yeah. a little while to get liquidity out of it. The challenge mm -hmm. of the watch world today is if I wanted to sell the watch that was on my wrist and I needed cash immediately, I oftentimes have to take a hit on the amount of money that I'm going to get back for that watch. Right. And so mm -hmm. our yeah. hope was if we launch auctions, it allows sellers that want to get paid fast to get a guarantee to get paid within seven days and mm. uh, just kind of creates this new type of liquidity in the platform. It's been super fun. We launched, we're, we've launched just over a month ago at this point. So we've only been kind of operating the auctions for, for just over a month, but you know, we've done yep. north of a hundred auctions and, and the sell through rate has been Very insanely cool. high and, and we've been super excited with it. So it's been great. Very cool. So we touched on the buyer and seller, um, but I'm sure the listeners, as we kind of wrap up here, how does Bezel then monetize? What does that look like for your point of view, if you can share that? Yeah. So uh, typical kind of marketplace fee structure in the sense that we take commission on the seller side. So mm -hmm. um, the way the process works is if a seller lists the watch, uh, they pay nothing, uh, which is kind of live on our platform. And then once the watch sells, like we take our commission out of that and the commission scales based on the number of watches you sell. So as you sell mm -hmm. more watches, the take rate goes down and it creates this kind of really fun gamified system where, you know, we reward our best sellers and, and uh, kind of keep them on as, as very loyal members of the system. And then we obviously have a bunch of really awesome add-on services like warranties and things like that. And, and mm -hmm. uh, obviously a lot more launching in that space to really like our bed and our goal is can we support all aspects of collecting for you on the watch side? So we don't want just want to be the place where you buy your watch. You want to be the place where, you know, you service your watch, you insure your watch. There's a lot of really interesting stuff that we can do there. So that's mm -hmm. kind of a, a hint of, of where we're moving in, in kind of the next couple months. Very cool. Well, Quaid, I'd like to conclude each episode with this. Um, if you can share one piece of advice with an aspiring entrepreneur, maybe something you've learned or regret along the way, what would you say that would be? I think the... I think if you ask me this question 10 different times, I'd probably give you 10 answers. So you're getting, yeah. you're getting today's answer, but when we're talking <laughs> about fundraising, I think the, the most effective thing that, that I learned in the fundraising process, um, and I learned this very quickly from a lot of kind of our earliest angels that, that I was very lucky to have around the table. Uh, we thought about fundraising as like, not just capital. You thought about it as like a mechanism for us creating an unfair advantage. So, if if there were folks that you could get around the table that are going to unlock strategic advantages for you as a business, that is worth so much more 
than the number that they're going to give you. Like a lot of our like most valuable, impactful investors did not write the largest checks, right? And so yeah. that's where the celebrity conversations went in because it helped us solve the problem of how do we convince someone to spend 10 plus thousand dollars on a product that's existed for two months? Like, how do you do that? And you do that by saying there's these big names around it. Or like, if we're lacking in some credibility or some access point where we want to be in two years, how do I knock on that person's door now and get them involved in the business now? Because in the best case, they write a check and they accelerate that. In the worst case, Mm -hmm. They heard me tell them what I want to do in two years so that in two years, when we've hopefully done it, they're like, okay, you've established credibility with me now. Like you did what you said you were going to do. I am at least kind of feeling like I can trust you. Right. So I think yep. that was one of the biggest ones. And then I think the second part is just like, we talked about this, so I'm hammering it home again, but I think yep. I was naive when I started the business. I was super focused on like valuation and the time of the market that we were in and Mm. businesses in 2021 were not necessarily being built for longevity. They were being built for like quick growth, quick flips, quick sales, like quick secondary moments for founders and just doubling down that like you shouldn't make this jump to start the business unless you're so excited about it and excited about spending every moment of your life solving it for the next 10 years. And Mm -hmm. if the answer is still, I'm like, can't sleep because I want to do this, then hell yeah, do it. If the answer is, ah, like I, I really just was hoping that like this would make money, then, Mm -hmm. you know, it's a challenge. Right. So not to say that like doing things for economic means is not like, this is a job. Right. But yeah, there's a lot of jobs that are a lot more stable and a lot easier than this. So make sure that you're in it for the long run and you're excited about that. That's a great point. Well, Quaid, thank you so much for joining me today. And to listeners out there, make sure to uh, check out shop.getbezel.com.